Hello, I'm Mark, and this is In the Round on Amateur Bus Tutorial Series, Part 12, Short Hair. The challenge of rendering hair in clay is to create from a solid mass of heavy plastic material the impression of thousands of loose, almost weightless individual strands. This is a serious sculptural challenge and will necessitate a high degree of stylization, which is why hyperrealist sculptors forego sculpting hair completely and just use real hair. Although there are an infinite variety of hair types and styles, the guiding principle for sculpting all of them is sectioning. By dividing the hair up into sections and further dividing each of these sections into smaller subsections and these yet again into smaller subsections, and by ensuring that each section and subsection all the way down to the finest strands has a source, a direction of growth, and a termination point, and that each relates to the others passing under or over, merging or dividing in a coherent way, it is possible to approach the formal sense of lightness and motion necessary for sculpted hair to feel real. The primary sections of the hair are the top, the back, the wings, and above the ear. The source for the top and back section of the hair is the crown, from which the hair radiates in a spiral, sometimes more than one. The front section will typically grow forward and to either side, but can be styled to go back. This is where you'll find parts in the hair. The back generally grows down in a uniform field. This uniformity makes the back superficially simple to sculpt, but difficult to make interesting. The source for the wings and above the ear sections are the temples. The direction of growth is typically back, down, and over the ear. Although there will be some variation in the direction of growth from person to person, these patterns can be seen in most short haircuts. Also, in general, the straighter the hair, the more apparent the growth pattern will be. The curlier the hair, the less apparent, due to its bending almost immediately after leaving the scalp. Before we begin building up these primary sections, note that ordinarily it's best to rough in the masses for short hair before posing a bust, as it helps you to better judge its overall proportions. This can be particularly useful if you're attempting a likeness, because the hair contributes greatly to the overall weight and balance of the head. For this series, however, I've waited until now, because I also intend to demonstrate the basics of sculpting long hair, which, because it falls past the neck, is best blocked in after posing. First, mass in the big sections. I generally start with the top and work my way down and around to the back. Expect that this will take a lot of clay. By far the most common mistake beginners make with short and long hair is to radically underestimate its volume. Hair is big, even short hair. Use soft clay and raking fingers to start to establish the directions of growth. Throughout the process of massing in the sections, continue to check the profile line from many different angles to ensure that there aren't any shallow spots. Pay particular attention to the areas on either side of the crown where the back section meets the wings. Beginners often neglect these spots. Once you've built up sufficient mass in the primary sections and established the general directions of growth, start to subdivide them into smaller sections. If there's a part in the hair, Make that your first division and work out from it. Make additions to bulk up the subsections as necessary. If the clay is moist, you can rely heavily on your fingers to articulate these larger sections, or you can start to use loop and compression tools. Serrated loops are particularly good at this stage. I've here begun to articulate a rather boringly styled straight, fine hair type. This is a good starter hair, as its simplicity makes it easier to see how the principles of sectioning, oppositional motion, and definition are put into practice. I'll be sculpting more active, complex hair in part 13, but given the infinite variety of possible hair types and styles, these two examples will still be far from sufficient. I'd recommend, therefore, doing a little additional research into classical and neoclassical busts for more insight into the many ways to sculpt hair. As with the features, it can be beneficial to do a refining pass to clean up superficial turbulence so that you can better see the structures of the sections. I find that a very slightly damp abrasion tool, like reticulated foam, can be quite effective for this. Although a little moisture can be useful here, use it cautiously, as it's easy to soften the sections together, undermining your efforts to articulate them. Beginners often assume that using water to smooth everything out will make the hair seem sleek and soft, like real hair. 
In practice, the result is more like melted wax. Smoothness will be important for many, although not all, hair types, but it's the smoothness of clean, sharply defined lines, not of the material itself. Think the edge of a blade rather than molded plastic. A stiff bristle flat brush is one of the best refining tools because it allows you to shape your sections as you refine and even, if you're careful, amplify your definition. Sharp definition is crucial because it's the best way to suggest the lightness of real hair. Abrupt transitions between light and shadow will imply the fineness of the individual strands and, when articulated at an acute angle, will conceal the actual thickness of the clay. Work your way down to smaller and smaller sections, attending to the relationships between them, how they move against, under, and over each other, how they merge and divide. It can sometimes be helpful to mark in the sections before sculpting them, but you'll still need to make the translation into three dimensions, establishing a hierarchy of forms and the relationships between them. The length of the sections will imply the length of the hair. Sections terminate either when they come off the head or pass under another section. Avoid making sections that are longer than those around them. Pay particular attention to transition areas where longer hair overhangs or fades into shorter hair. Articulate the hairline in an alternating rhythm of smooth and sharp transitions from the scalp. If you outline the hair uniformly all around, it will look like a hair hat. Try to develop a rhythm of oppositional motion. If the overall motion of one section is to twist clockwise as it falls down and curves to the left, then twist the section next to it counterclockwise and curve it to the right. In very straight hair, these oppositional motions should be subtle and attenuated. In more curly, textured hair, they should be more active and varied. Once all of the smaller sections look good, you can consider texture, which I'll talk about briefly now, and which I encourage you to experiment with a little, but which is really best left until after reassembly, given the damage the hair is likely to incur during that process. Texture should subtly amplify the motion and implied texture already established by the interplay of the sections. Typically, it's best to twist the texture around each section in subtle counterpoint to its overall direction. You can use very small ribbon tools, compression tools, dry, stiff bristle brushes, and even needle tools if your touch is very light. Just don't cut in a bunch of deep grooves. Avoid parallel lines like those made by a fork, but also don't crosshatch. Above all, practice. With experience, you'll find what combination of sections and surface detail are best suited for implying various hair textures and weights. Hair can take a very long time to sculpt, as long as or longer than the features. Be patient, and don't be afraid to start over. The two most frequent ways beginners attempt to render eyebrows in clay is to incise a series of grooves, either directly into the skin or into thick tubes of clay laid above the eyes. Neither of these methods are particularly convincing. The first tends to look like wounds, the second like caterpillars. The best method is something of a middle ground between the two. Adding a small volume of clay is necessary when forming an eyebrow, but it's very slight and must be articulated to follow the contour of the hair growth. Likewise, texture is necessary, but must be rendered with both subtlety and specificity. Both how the volume of the eyebrow is defined and how the texture is applied is determined by the pattern of the hair growth, which will never be uniform unless it's aggressively groomed to be so. In a typical eyebrow, there are two primary directions of hair growth, up and down. These meet to form a crest that runs in counterpoint to the contour of the eyebrow itself. Immediately, the direction of growth is predominantly up and inward. Toward the peak, the direction of growth rotates up and out. Here, it begins to collide with the downward and outward growing hair from above, forming the crest. There is sometimes, though not always, a transition point a little before the peak, where the predominantly upward medial growth gives over to a predominantly downward lateral growth. In this image of an eyebrow wig, the growth pattern of a typical eyebrow is very clear. Start to form the eyebrows with two thin, tapered coils. Lay them over the eyes, angling gently up from the root of the nose, peaking somewhere between the midpoint and lateral angle of the eye, then gently curving down and tapering away to meet the surface of the skin at about the outer rim of the orbit. Delicately define the arch of the eyebrows beneath catching a soft line of shadow. Facet the eyebrow to define the crest where the hair growing up meets the hair growing down. There should be a sharp transition between the highlight of the top plane and the midlight of the front plane. 
The first pass of texture will establish the growth pattern of the hair, but because the clay is still very soft, it must be applied with delicacy. I find that the most effective tools for this are very small serrated loop tools and stiff bristle brushes. For coarser textured eyebrows, you might carve in a few deeper ridges with a small, sharp ribbon tool. Once the eyebrows have stiffened up, usually after the reassembly, you can use a sharp needle tool to amplify a few darker shadows with very slight, delicate grooves. For facial hair, the principles are much the same. When the hair is shorter, it will be rather like a large eyebrow, when longer, more like coarse, bristly hair. These are the typical sections of facial hair. As with the features, final detailing of the hair and eyebrows will have to wait until the bust is off the armature. For now, if you're happy with the hair you've sculpted and want to move on to removal, hollowing, and reassembly, skip ahead to part 14. If you want to learn more about the basics of sculpting long hair, join me next time for part 13.